I was raised in Howell from 1957, graduated in 1967. Uh, my father was John R. Theo, who was the first radio announcer at WHMI in 1957. We used to have teen dances every Saturday night, from 9 to midnight. And uh, I graduated from Howell in 67, and I became an orthopedic surgeon eventually, and I just uh, retired four years ago after 32 years as an orthopedic surgeon. And we live in Charlotte, Michigan. And I'm Barbara Pollock Thiel. Uh, I moved here in 1949. My dad was Dr. Robert Pollock. He started at the old sanitarium, which was, which way is that? West of town? South of town? Yeah. South of town. He started there in November of 1949 and moved down into the city in 1952 to practice with Dr. Barton and Dr. Hill. And I graduated with him in 1967. We have three sons and six and a half grandchildren. I was born and raised uh, in Howell in 1949. Matter of fact, I was born in the old McPherson Hospital about two blocks from the library here. Um, lived in Howell, went to school here, graduated from high school in 1967, and then uh, moved to Ann Arbor for a few years uh, with my high school sweetheart. We got married in 1972. And uh, once we had kids, we decided to move back to Howell because of the experiences that we had growing up here, and this is where we wanted to raise our children. I was uh, the mayor of the city in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, was named uh, Citizen of the Year in 1991, I believe it was, so back in the dark ages. <laughs> so still live here in Howell on West Grand River down by the old Citizens Building, and uh, uh, We'll probably be buried from McDonald's Funeral Home, which is about a couple of blocks from here, too. <laughs> I remember study hall. It was a big room, and, and it, there were, with the three levels of the school, not each staircase went to each section of the building. So you may have a class over here. Go around to this staircase to get to your next class. Well, the, gym, the gym seated about 100 people. And the floor had a great big ripple in it for the sidelines. I mean, a bump. It was about a six-inch bump, wasn't it, Mike? Yeah, I think and so, yeah. You couldn't run on that sidelines because you'd kill yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you ran anywhere past the basket, uh, Rick Hahn was in our class. One time he made a basket, and he went out through the door. Through these <laughs> doors, he flew open. Yeah. But those, that gym was so tiny. You had a big balcony, and you couldn't have more than 100 people watch a basketball game. When we were freshmen, girls had to wear these gym uniforms. It was like a one-piece shorts, green <coughs> shirt top thing, and we had to take showers. And Mrs. Cassidy was a stickler. You had to take showers. And I, we, went, we would go over to Bennett Field. Remember that? Go over to Bennett Field during gym and play baseball and stuff over there because it was only three blocks from the school. I met my wife in study hall, as a matter of fact, and uh, uh, told... Uh, Paul Strang that that's the girl I'm going to marry and sure enough we did and uh, the thing I remember about it is it's the same high school that my dad attended when he went to high school here and some of the things I do remember are the stairs they were grooved from so many kids going up and down the stairs they weren't <laughs> level anymore they had a big groove in them and um, oh the classrooms were interesting to say the least Johnny makes a lot of good points about the gym it was horrible <laughs> but um, you know we we had a good time it was a good time we a uh, couple blocks at lunchtime we'd go to Pettibones uh, had a little neighborhood grocery uh, that we ran over to during lunchtime and uh, grab some candy bars or chips or stuff and uh, paying uh, for them of course paying for them of course yes, yes absolutely and of course, uh, Pettibones later owned the old Howell House, uh, which uh, was certainly one of uh, my favorites, and I'm sure you guys yeah, really enjoyed great. it too. And yeah, Pettibones Grocery was only like three blocks from my house. We went there a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I can remember Marsha Blanchard when she was taking driver's ed. Uh, I think Chuck Baduro was her driver's ed teacher, and remember she ran into the back of the school, yes. crashed into the school. <laughs> yeah in the driver's ed car. Yes. <laughs> she didn't get her permit right away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We used to have, a, on football game days, you'd go from the old Michigan Avenue School and they'd have the marching band lead us. Mm -hmm. And you'd walk all the way to Page Field. That was a big tradition. Mm -hmm. Football game days, home games, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you used to walk behind. And Fred Sherwood was the marching band 
uh, drum major. Drum major. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he used to go out in front of the band and march. That was a big event. And it I seemed mean. like a long way. And trying to, in retrospect, it was only about six, <coughs> six or seven blocks. Not very far. Yeah, yeah. but it mm-hmm. felt like a long walk. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And going, you know, going out to the uh, new high school, being in the first two classes out there, which I think is a freshman campus now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was exciting. It was new. It was fresh. There was a gym that we could play basketball yeah. in. Um, it was, it just was really neat. A um, little bit more room to get into trouble, you know, <laughs> around around the schoolyard and everything. So it was, it was pretty exciting. It, you know, we were lucky because growing up in a town like Howell, the people that are in your class and the class before you and after you, you're pretty close because you get to know them real well. It's not a huge community. I remember growing up, uh, everybody in town, it seemed, knew everybody else. Uh, you never dared get into any trouble yep. because Your if you did, would hear about it. they'd hear about it before you even got home, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you had to be real careful and uh, be cool. Remember <laughs> when, they, when they built the new high school in 65, mm-hmm. it was a million and a half dollars. And my dad was on the radio, and they had a vote to run the school, the millage. Mm-hmm. And about 50 people voted against his millage. And my father got on and he called his soapbox, and he was furious. And the 6 a.m., thought, how in the world could you not vote to run the school after you built it? Right. And it was uh, those times that you could question, you know, somebody doing something like that. What are you thinking about? One of the biggest issues was whether to have a pool or not, remember? <laughs> yes. And nobody wanted a pool at the new <coughs> high school because we had the lake. And, uh, you know, it was a beautiful lake and everything else. But since we had a lake, there was no need for a pool at the high school. Well, mischief, I can certainly answer that. (laughs) Mike, Um, you you know, one thing that was unique, we had one of the former mayors was an electronics genius um, and good friends of all of ours. And um, back then, you know, we were at the cornerstone of growing into adults. And when we were seniors... (laughs) For the first time, for many of us anyways, we decided that we'd have a grasser or two. And uh, so we'd go out into the country. And one thing that always started the grassers is we'd get the senior girls to do a snipe hunt. They didn't know, you know, they'd never seen a snipe. They didn't know about clicking the rocks or the bricks together. We gave them burlap bags to catch them, you know. When, when they run at you, you got to get them in the burlap bag. And then, you know, somebody, I, some adult, I'm sure, would buy a some beers uh, for us and uh, but our electronics genius former mayor had a Volkswagen and he set up this deal in his car it was like a radio transmitter or something <coughs> with a huge huge speaker on the roof of the car and what he was doing is he was monitoring the police radios <laughs> so if there was a call that you know in some farmers field there was a drinking party going on we'd hear it over this you know, loudspeaker that he had set up, but we could all get out of there I before our parents or things. <laughs> yeah. we, we, I think Mike and I one time, it was, uh, I think senior year, I think a couple other guys with us, we were coming down Main Street, and we had a bag of navy beans, <laughs> and we were throwing them against windows. Mm-hmm. We were seniors in 66, mm-hmm. and we got home, Mike, I know, I got home at 9 o'clock, and Dad was sitting there smoking a cigarette, and he said, well, you'll go over there tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., you boys, because it was one of, it was a state trooper's, house we didn't know <laughs> so at nine o'clock we're over there the next morning sweeping up the navy beans and he came out and he said thanks boys and there was no <laughs> there was no lawsuits it was yeah you know stuff like that yeah and if you had you know when you got in trouble out the new high school too <coughs> um because you know we had unauthorized senior skip days and that kind of stuff i can remember i got caught one one year well probably more than once who knows <laughs> but um The thing, my punishment was at lunchtime for a week, I had to go out in the yard, the front yard where the grass is, and they had these big rollers that you push along to flatten out the the sod and everything. And that was my job for a week is to go out at lunchtime and take one of these rollers and roll the sod back and forth for lunch hour. You have anything? Not as far as getting into trouble. Oh. You know who oh. I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> when Mike and I were playing uh, senior year in football at Page Field, they had a bar. It was an isometric bar. You're supposed to push on it. Mm-hmm. And there was only equipment we had for lifting weights. That was it. Yeah. You came in at your weight, and that's what you... So we were teaching the backs to run under this bar. 
<laughs> and Mike hit his head so hard it knocked him out. He was flat on his back. <laughs> and I'm leaning over Mike. Mike, are you okay? Get up. And the coaches are screaming at me, get out of here. Go back. And he got up. He was so dizzy. I don't think it ever changed, has it, Mike? No, it hasn't. It really hasn't. <laughs> but now got, these days, of course, there's so much more and now worried, you're so about worried about concussions. Yeah. You know, I look back, and I was a team doctor up in Gaylor for 18 years in orthopedics, and the stuff that I watched change. I would tell the coaches about Mike hitting his head, and, God, they were appalled by that. You know, how you got to take care of these kids. But I'll never forget Mike. And then the whole rest of practice, you couldn't go in. I know. He had such a headache, and he was staggering around. <laughs> Well, one of our good buddies and <laughs> classmates, uh, Mike Emerson, um, he was he was a large guy. We put him at middle guard because he could block, you know, like three people at one time. <coughs> and but Mike wore these shoes, and we practiced at Page Field, which back then was gravel, you know, uh, not not on the field, but in the practice area. And these metal spikes that he would have on the bottom of his shoes, the gravel would wear them down and so they were like spears on the bottom of his <laughs> yeah. shoes and we just stayed clear of Mike when Mike was around and uh, because you didn't dare want to get stepped on with those babies. Well, we talked about snipe hunts and I had my dad 63 Chevy Supersport mm -hmm. and we were at the Kroger parking lot and one of our classmates backed into it, smashed the whole front end in. And so I went home and I told dad, somebody wrecked your car, you want to come out and see it? <laughs> No, I don't want to see it. So he got the radio station next morning before school. He called me at 6.30. What did you do to my car? <laughs> we never turned into insurance company. Nothing. This kid got a job working at Vasho's grocery store. And he worked at Vasho's. And my dad talked to his dad. And he paid off the entire repair of that car by going to work. There were no suits. You didn't have insurance and stuff. You didn't worry about it. But that was another snipe on. Yeah. Well, that's back when we used to cruise the gut. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. We'd get at one end of the town, and uh, we'd cruise down Grand River, turn around in the Kroger parking lot, and cruise back through. The citizens. And yeah. the the summer, citizens, yeah. The summer after senior year, that they had street dances in Fowlerville. And I remember being there one time. I don't recall who I was with or anything. But some kid picked on John Dickey. And John Dickey was a state champion wrestler. <laughs> he took that guy down like that. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> It is amazing. We used to have uh, Val's Pizza used to be right over here on the corner. And we used to, at times, after school or after football, I can't remember which, we'd go over there and we would get these large cheese and pepperoni pizzas and Sprite. And then we'd bring them over and sit on the front of the library lawn, eat the pizzas and drink the Sprite and have belching contests. <laughs> There was, there, you mentioned, there was, when my dad was up at the station one time, 1960, mm -hmm. he'd sit out on the window up above Shippey's Color Center. That's where the rated WHOI was. Now it's and that little wine store. He would watch people walking the streets and talk about him. And there was a senior at Howell High School, I'm not going to say his name, but he went into Spag's drugstore at 11 in the morning. And dad said, I wonder what he's doing out of class. Mm -hmm. Why is he, I thought school was going on. So that when he got home that night, his mother was waiting for him at the door. <laughs> and you're cutting classes? <laughs> like Mike said earlier, you couldn't do anything in this town. But, you know, you'd find out about yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I you're, had a headlight out in my mother's 65 Corvair. I was 20. And I was a bad boy. I'd been to our minister's house. He was gone. Mm -hmm. And he had beer. So I had a beer. And I was driving home with a headlight out. Blame it on the minister. Yes, yeah, it was. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I got stopped by a state trooper who knew my dad really well. Dad mm -hmm. had died already. And, and he said, Johnny, what are you doing out here? Mm -hmm. what, what the hell are you doing out here? And your headlight's out. And he said, have you, had a, have you been drinking? I said, well, I had a beer at home with mother. Mm -hmm. He said, well, you get your butt home and go home now. Mm -hmm. No breathalyzer. There was no rest. Mm -hmm. It was just very simple. Yeah. You know, it's funny because um, talking about the police, one of the things, Tom Kopolowski and I were lifeguards down at the beach for three summers uh, uh, after graduation from high school. And we were hired by Paul Bennett, as a matter of fact, who for years ran Parks and Rec and was Mr. Parks and Rec in this area for years and years and years. And one of the advantages of being a lifeguard down there is you got to know all the cops, Charlie Mason, and then there was this guy that we called uh, Barney Fife. I can't remember his name, but uh, <laughs> you got to know him and everything. And so you always felt a little safe because 
you knew that maybe if you got stopped for you know maybe going a little bit fast or whatever that at least you knew who they were and maybe they wouldn't give you a ticket <laughs> that must be tough in a small town because the cops know everybody and they mm -hmm. probably feel mm -hmm. a little too lenient at times yeah. well, i worked yeah. in a cemetery for six summers from 64 through college but Dwayne Meyer was my boss, the sexton, and he was a wonderful person. But I made 70 cents an hour mm -hmm. in 1964, and that was great. My dad would drop me off for mother, and I didn't drive, but we cut grass. And we had People to hand were dying trim, to get in there. Had to, <laughs> That's had, why they put fences around. <laughs> had to hand trim every yeah. stone in that cemetery yeah. every year for six years. Yeah. So we got to know the cemetery so well. Tom Longeway and I worked there, Yeah. and we knew every stone. People would come in. You didn't have to go look it up. It's right over here in this section. We know where you go. But you, that was nice times. You know? used to come down and visit Copy and I at the beach all the only time. Only to see the girls. Yeah, only to see the girls. We'd You're come right. We'd down and pick up the garbage and we'd, we'd see you guys. Yeah, and it was funny because back then nobody knew anything about, uh, you know, sunblock or any of that stuff. No. Kapolowski and I used uh, baby oil and iodine. Yeah, because it made you more tan. That's right. And we were really <laughs> dark by the end of Our the summer. Our house had a white roof, so we would go up on the roof because we thought we'd get a better tan being on the white roof. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's funny because we got breaks every once in a while down at the beach, and we'd go out uh, skiing. You know, the Pollocks would bring their boat over or whatever, <laughs> and we'd go out skiing. Well, this one year, I think it was the second year that Tom and I lifeguarded, he fell while he was skiing, and he ripped the top of his thumb off. Yep. And um, so we all went out looking for Tom. You know Tom's thumb, and <laughs> even after that, uh, at, after that happened, we still to this day sometimes call him Tom Thumb. And uh, you know Dr. Stuber, who was you know one of the uh, surgeons here in town, did an operation for Tom where they stuck the bone, the stub, in to his stomach, and uh, attached it to his stomach. And to this day, his thumb has hair growing out of it. <laughs> well, in, in 1970. I was a uh, senior at state. I think Barb and I were seniors. You were senior. And I had never seen surgery. And so Pat May, Dr. May, I was stripping and waxing floors at the hospital for 80 cents an hour. And Pat says, you're going to go see a surgery. And he put a mask on me and gown and gloves. And Barb's father, Dr. Pollock, was the assistant. And Dr. Stuber was doing hernia surgery. Mm -hmm. And Barb's grandmother was a circulating nurse, Charlotte Heiner. And all I remember is the incision was made and I passed out and fell right on the floor, down. At our 25th reunion in 92, Pat May saw me, and he came up and said, John, do you still pass out in surgery? <laughs> By that time, I was already in orthopedist for like 11 or 12 years, and I said, no, sir, I don't pass out in surgery. <laughs> but I never lived that down because Barb's dad, who became my father-in-law, was the assistant. Speaking of Dr. May, uh, when he had his office on a big house on the corner of Grand River, I don't know if it was Barnard, anyway, it was a big house, and his office was in the basement. And one year, the kids, he had nine kids, all the kids got chickies and bunnies for Easter. So I remember being down there, we were all carrying the chickies and bunnies all around the office, and we were like showing these chickies and bunnies in the office. <laughs> mm -hmm. he, uh, he used that goat to uh, eat his lawn, supposedly. You know, Doc May, we all know what a great and wonderful guy and community supporter he was over the years and you know the thing that I think is cool about it is my mom was one of his first nurses because one of their first offices before they went out to Byron Road was down here on uh, Clinton Street uh, at Corridor State what's the one that's blocked off you know doesn't go yeah. over the railroad tracks court court it's I think it's on court and uh, and Clinton and that's where one of their first offices were, and that's my mom worked for them for her whole nursing career. So, what year did you start there? Oh God, after I, your, I don't after remember. Board, yeah. yeah. Wow. But um, yeah, it uh, it only grew from there. I think Betty Anderson was one of the nurses there too, and uh, um, Edie Kors maybe. I'm not too sure. I can't remember the other ones. There was a, a different relationship, I think, at that time in town with physicians. Mm -hmm. You knew, like her dad was here with Barton and Hill. And we had always gone to Dr. Jacobs, one of the Jacobs, because he was right downstairs at the radio station. When dad would have a problem, he'd go see him. And uh, Dr. May, all these people, you never, if Dr. Jacobs was out of town, mm -hmm. I'd go see Pat May if I had a problem, or Dr. Woodworth, I think mm -hmm. Woodworth? Woodworth, yeah. yeah. You know, those people. And Hoffman was in there. You know, room. you had a choice. And their home phones were published in the phone book. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Phone, yes. In fact, we never went to the show. We always went out to the drive-in. 
because dad would be like, well, I'm off and I want to go to the show and I don't want all these patients asking me questions. <laughs> so we always went to the drive-in. I got a real thrill, my uh, real, real good thrill, about three or four years ago, I got to kind of do a eulogy for Dr. and Mrs. Jacobs at McDonald funeral. And I did surgery on both of them, hand surgery, years ago. And I told the family and the people there, I said, I had the thrill of having him take care of me when I was seven, but then I did surgery on him. And he said to me when he came up to Gaylord one time, he said, would you call me Wendell? I said, well, sir, I don't call my mother Dolores. I'll, I'll call you <laughs> Dr. Jacobs. And, and this, I took care of Millie and, and Charlotte. And they said the same thing. And they're in their 90s. But I said, no, I'll call you Dr. and Mrs. Jacobs. That was it. That's how you yeah. grew up. The hospital up here was really something, wasn't it? Remember the big long tube oh, yeah. on the side of it? And then across yeah. the street from that was the <coughs> fire department. Yes. And uh, I think back then we had three or four um, trucks. It was interesting because, as I remember the story, they only paid the first three guys that got to the fire station right. to go out on the call. And I lived down on Byron Road. We <coughs> lived on Byron Road at the time, right next to Jim Woodruff who was one of the owners of Purdy and Woodruff Lumberyard, and he was a fireman. And when that whistle went off all over town, you know, saying there was a fire, these guys would jump in the car, and I think they'd go 90 miles an hour <laughs> so they could pull one of the first three tabs, you know, at the firehouse so they'd get paid for making the run. Yes. <laughs> but what if it was a big fire and they needed more than three guys? Well, <laughs> then they'd be there. Then they'd be there, yeah. They'd always be there. Yeah. The city hall was right there, too, mm -hmm. originally. Yeah, well, you so. tell, tell them why your dad came here, because you, he wanted to go to a TB sanitarium. Yeah, my dad had TB when he was in med school. Actually, when he was in residency. He spent a year in Denver at a TB sanitarium. And so his parents, he grew up in St. Louis, but his parents had a cottage in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So he wanted the closest TB sanitarium to Clear Lake, and that's why he came here. And then I think he worked there for three years and then moved down into town. We talk about Hull. When we moved here in 57, my mother just told me this yesterday. She got off, we lived in Ludington for your dad started radio in Ludington, and she got off the bus in Hull and she started crying because the hot town was so small. She said, this is horrible, I can't live here. Because <laughs> she grew up in East Detroit. My mother's she now 90, she's 90, but she said, I got off that bus and I started crying. This town is too tiny, it's <laughs> small and horrible, I can't live here. <laughs> Mr. Badura let us all just copy our reports right out of the book, and as long as you were a girl standing up there in your skirt, he didn't care what it said. And he put all the cute <laughs> girls in the front row. <laughs> yeah, we had a class one time, and, and God, he was looking at this one girl, and Mike started laughing. Mm. And all he said is, Yost, out of here. He threw out of the class. Yeah, he's picking his nose. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that, was, uh, that, that was. I came, uh, Mrs. Hicks. Stan Hicks's wife, mm -hmm. and Tom was their son, played football with us. But well, Mrs. Hicks is my favorite. Birkenstock School, fourth grade. She, every morning, had to pledge allegiance and the Lord's Prayer. That's what you said, because Stan was a minister. But every morning, you couldn't do that today. You couldn't no, have the, couldn't. the Lord's Prayer with the, but that was fourth grade. I don't know how you guys did kindergarten, because you guys ended up er, er, in, um, eventually out at, okay. Cause because when the the town was growing so fast that the schools kept getting too small. Right. Because I started at um, Michigan Avenue for kindergarten, and then first through fourth at Southeast, and then out to Birkenstock for fifth. <coughs> then I think I went to sixth grade at Northeast, and then when we moved to the lake, the rest was at Northwest. Mm -hmm. So I had every school but Southwest. Did, I, met, I met Barb in second grade when mm -hmm. we moved here, March of 57. I walked into second grade class, Mrs. Hagney, and Barb was in my class along with Barry Dorn, who's our dentist, and Jeff Salisbury. And so I met, <laughs> I met people in my wedding and my future wife mm -hmm. in second grade, but we never dated till we were in college. But I've known Barb all those years. And Barb's dad used to do all of our sports physicals. Mm -hmm. We used to, um, or we started kindergarten, I had Mrs. Kelly, or no, Mrs. Stipe. I had, I had Mrs. Mrs. Stipe. Stipe, so you must have been yeah. in my class. Um, we were... I can't remember where we started. I think I started before Mrs. Stipe. I think I was over at West Ward for like a very short period of time. And then we moved to the old A&P store on the corner of Sibley and Michigan. And but then I was we in, moved to the sure high school. I was school. at the school the whole time, so. Yeah. I think, huh. we, I think 
she had like a morning and afternoon well, maybe that i think it. maybe we were in opposites but i can rem remember moving three times in kindergarten and then the year after uh kindergarten they had the the you know the regional the elementary schools done and i ended up over at southwest where i went there from yeah. first grade through eighth grade yeah, yeah.